and said something that might have drawn the security guard's attention to that area. I was sure of that, and little else. I remembered a conversation I had with Dennis after learning about the scientists and engineers who'd been killed while working with the reactor. I would have thought that an incident of that type would make the news. When I asked Dennis why it hadn't, he simply said, We took care of that. I had understood before that these men had control over every bit of information. If something was going to happen to me, no one would ever know the truth of how I came to lose my life. Oddly, that didn't trouble my sleep that night, and I woke up feeling more rested than I had in a while. By sunset the next day, I knew what was next. I answered the phone, and Dennis Mariani was on the line. I'll be at your home in twenty-five minutes. We need to meet. I knew it was useless to make any kind of excuse, so I said, I'll be here. When I answered the door to find Dennis standing on the porch, I was surprised to see that there was no vehicle other than my car in the driveway. You're going to be driving, he said while looking at his watch. Let's go. After I got through buckling in, I asked him, Where to? Indian Springs. Though he didn't elaborate, I understood that he meant Indian Springs Air Force Base. It was located just north of Las Vegas. I had thought it was deactivated, and that troubled me for a few beats. Why was I going to an abandoned military base alone and at night? It all seemed too sinister. Then I remembered seeing some craft taking off from there every now and then. Maybe there'd be a full staff on sight people who would be able to account for my presence there. We drove along in silence, the tension thick. I was trying to stay calm and not let on that I was thinking too much about what was going on, not let him see that I was on edge. Didn't they once use Indian Springs back in the day to aid nuclear testing? I thought I read something about sniffer planes being launched from there. Dennis grunted an indistinct response. For the remainder of the hour drive, neither of us spoke. I squirmed in my seat, glancing nervously into the rearview mirror, dreading what was to come. As we all had at the start of the drive back home after being detained by the police, I frantically tried to come up with a reason why I'd been out there with my friends and family. Eventually, I gave up. By the time I saw the first signs for the base, I was resigned to doing this, all I could do was fall back on the truth. Once we were through the gates and then into an office, Dennis was joined by two other men, both armed. They looked like they were part of the security team out at S-4. Dennis made it apparent that he was really pissed off. He sat down in a chair and pulled it close to mine. With his face inches from mine, he said, "'When we told you this was a highly classified project, how did that get twisted in your mind to think that you could tell your friends about it? Something about the way he phrased it and the absurdity of the premise made me smile and chuckle a little bit. I truly thought at first that Dennis was injecting a note of levity into the situation. I was wrong. The man seated next to me reached for his weapon and said, That's probably not funny. Dennis continued, Though he didn't raise his voice much, his accusatory tone was sharp, and he seemed as if he was biting off each of the sounds he made. I sat there eyeing a black box on the table in front of me. Was it a microphone, part of some intercom system, or a recording device? Do you not understand the nature of the agreements you signed? Are you not aware of the consequences of violating those agreements? After a few minutes of simply sitting there and essentially being pummeled by the comments and questions, I was asked the most obvious questions, the first one that seemed to be one Dennis wanted me to answer. What was I doing out there, and why was I there with those people? I wasn't sure what you guys were going to do with me, once you stopped calling me in to work in the lab. Even before I could finish that second statement, I sensed that this was the wrong tack to take. Each of the men displayed body language that this was not the avenue to go down. Arms folded across a chest, a lean back in the chair, a lean forward, 
and a slow, nearly imperceptible shake of the head, an eyebrow quivering and then lifting. Thinking quickly on the go, I then smiled and said, Look, everybody knows that something to do with experimental aircraft and testing goes on out there. If you live in Vegas, you know that. So, when they heard I had a job out there, they assumed. All we did was go out there and watch the lights in the sky. I figured that would answer any of the questions they had, alleviate their curiosity, do a little disinformation. No big deal. No breach of security. I didn't tell them anything. Once I got started talking, a kind of mental momentum took over. By the time I was halfway into it, I'd almost convinced myself that what I was saying was true. At the same time, I wondered about my assumption that these guys were part of the security group. Would they have been allowed to hear what Dennis was talking about with me? Don't you understand that this project is far more important than any one single person? Dennis asked. More important than your life. More important than mine. Like I said, they knew that things were going on with aircraft. Then, uncertain of the other two men, and careful not to say anything about the alien nature of the propulsion system and craft, I added, These were lay people. The general public. They wouldn't have been able to figure out anything but what I told them. And I told them nothing. Nothing? Dennis jumped on that word immediately. Essentially nothing. Just that there were flights. What do you mean, essentially nothing? The guy to my left said. If you let me finish... I think you're finished. Dennis intervened. And just what is it that you think we're going to do with you and your friends? Nothing with them. I figured I would go back to work on the project. You smiling again? You think this is funny? Don't you understand how serious this is? The interrupter was at it again. Dennis sat back, as if to get a better view of the show. I wasn't aware that I had been smiling. Maybe under the stress of the situation, I had. I knew that I had to fight the urge to say that I understood the gravity of the situation. This isn't funny. This is no joke, the interrupter went on. Well, maybe Mr. Lazar doesn't understand what the rules are around here. They didn't see anything. A few lights in the sky. Oh, what a big deal. A few lights in the sky. The interrupter must not have liked my tone. He nudged the gun against me, and I lost my composure for a bit. This is ridiculous. It's not like I told them that what they were seeing was aliens flying around in their saucers. This is... I stopped myself. Dennis looked like I had kicked him in the balls. He recovered quickly and said to the interrupter, Please leave the room. Once the man left, Dennis switched off the device on the desk. He tore a sheet off the legal pad that had been sitting there. Presumably the whole time, though it hadn't registered with me until then, I was so shaken. Write down their names and their contact information. I hated the idea of having to do that. It was one thing for the police to have gotten it from their driver's licenses, but this was far more Judas-like an action. I felt my throat tighten. They have that information already. I want you to write it, Dennis said, his voice reaching a level of menace that I hadn't heard before. I knew then that this writing had some kind of significance beyond the simple gathering of information. My writing those names and figures down would be an act of betrayal, a demonstration that I was capable of violating any kind of trust. I don't know all that information. I don't have people's addresses and phone numbers committed to memory. Dennis continued to glare at me. Look, I'll admit it. I'm scared. I can't think straight right now. Dennis tapped the sheet of paper. Write it. Now. I'm telling you, I began, my voice sounding even to me like the bleeding of a sheep. I stopped and looked at the third who was in the room. The entire time he hadn't spoken, and he had displayed none of the gestures of disapproval or dismay that the others had and that I'd mentally catalogued earlier. He simply stared ahead impassively. Our eyes met, 
and he continued to regard me as if I was no consequence to him whatsoever. That indicated to me that he was the one I should be most concerned about. He was the one most capable of doing me harm. I was in such a quandary. They would know if I was giving them false information. That would lead them to believe that I had something to hide, that I was capable of other kinds of duplicity, that I had no regard for what they demanded of me, that I was loyal only to myself. If I didn't, I had something to hide, that I'd already committed some acts of duplicity, that I had no regard for what they demanded of me, that I was loyal to someone else. The last was true if I gave them the full information they asked for. Seeing no other way around it, I gave them some information, substituted Gene's office number for his home number, left many things blank, and gave them an empty promise that I would get them what they needed. I could neither be the stand-up guy who openly defied them, or the man who was willing to lie down and be run over by their threats. Instead, I sat there in that middle ground, finding nothing to be happy about, and wondering if the man's indifference was somehow a reflection of how I truly felt about myself. Was I too indifferent even to feel self-loathing? Next, I want you to tell us who you're working for, Dennis said, his lips pursing as he scanned the paper I'd returned to him. For you, for whoever you work for, for E.G. and G., I don't know. Naval intelligence was on the check, so I guess them. You know that's not what I mean. I know that you wanted to sabotage the project. That's clear. No, I said, recoiling in my chair. That's not true at all. Not one bit of it. This went on for a while, until Dennis looked at his watch. We're done here. For now. Go back home. Wait for my call. We'll probably have you come back in. His last statement was ambiguous. To work, or to be further interrogated? I didn't dare ask. I stood up, and as I did, the interrogator came back in the room. He handed Dennis a stack of papers. Dennis's eyes lit up. That's right, that's right, I almost forgot. He looked at the papers for a few moments. Sit down, sit down. He waved the papers at me, and they fluttered briefly before coming to rest. You do know your wife's having an affair, Dennis stated flatly. I sat there not willing to take the bait. Been going on for a while. Her flight instructor, a guy named Tony, started back in February. A Valentine's Day thing, I guess. Why are you doing this? I asked. You could make anything up. Even these? he said, holding up the papers. These are the transcripts to every call between them. Funny how nearly all of them took place when you weren't around. Seemed like your schedule was ideal for them to meet up. I tried to tell myself that what I'd said to Dennis was true. They could make anything up. But something deep in my gut told me that wasn't the case. I sat there feeling scooped out, like someone had taken a melon baller and eviscerated me from neck to nuts. When I told Dennis that I didn't want to see the transcripts, my voice sounded tinny, as if it was echoing inside that hollow space inside me. He slid them over anyway. I sat for a few seconds not looking at them. In that brief span, I knew that the empty space inside me was all of the denial I'd kept stored in there leeching away. I'd noticed that Tracy had been distracted and distant. I'd noticed that it seemed like every time I left the house, Tracy did too. At one point early in my time at S-4, Jason had come over to the house. We were going to test some new rocket motors for the fireworks display we put on. We left in my car, and I wasn't sure if I had all the motors, couldn't remember if I'd left a box on a shelf in the garage. Rather than go all the way out into the desert and then discover they weren't there, I pulled over and got out of the car to check what was in the hatch. Everything was there. I climbed back in and checked the wing mirror before I pulled out. There was Tracy's car. She had to have seen me, but she just drove right past. I dismissed it then, but after that 
noted but tried not to focus on the dozens of other similar things that happened. Phone calls ending abruptly, her changing plans at the last minute. I stopped myself from thinking any more about them. I wanted to look, but I didn't. I decided that I didn't need to look through a catalogue of my despair and devastation selecting which item to punish myself with to suit my mood at the time. Well, thanks, Dennis, I said as I slid the papers back to him. No, keep them, he said, sounding more jovial than I'd ever heard him before. Least we can do. Yeah, I said, channeling Jean at that moment. Your tax dollars at work. To say I walked out of there feeling completely devastated would be an understatement. Tracy's betrayal gutted me. I didn't want to linger on the Indian Springs site, thinking that there were likely to be surveillance cameras. I imagined Dennis sitting there and laughing at me, a deep satisfaction animating his face, if he saw me showing any signs of the anguish I was feeling. I drove away, and on the way home, my sorrow and disillusionment weighed heavily on me. I felt as if I was back in the Puritan days, and someone had attached stones to my body and submersed me in water. I had no energy to struggle against those forces dragging me down. Tracy had once rescued me from the despair that I experienced following my first wife's death, had given me hope that life could be good again. Now that hope had diminished. As the days went on after Dennis's revelation, I became resigned. I truly didn't care whether I lived or died. In addition to feeling betrayed and the sickening thoughts of her having a sexual relationship with another man, and how cliched the whole thing was, with a co-worker, with a man whose contact I'd encouraged and helped pay for, a flight instructor, I came to another gut-wrenching conclusion. One of the reasons why my security clearance was being delayed was due to Tracy's affair. Whoever was administrating the project and was in charge of evaluating my suitability for the security clearance knew this. A man whose wife is cheating on him is likely to find out about her infidelity at some point. He's likely to be emotionally unstable as a result. As a result, he wasn't the best candidate to be entrusted with the kinds of information that I was going to be, and had been, privy to. Not only had Tracy's affair destroyed me emotionally, it had severely damaged my chances of doing what I considered some of the most meaningful work I might ever do. As frustrated as I was with the processes in place at S4, the eventual product of our work could have proved to be life-altering for me and for millions of others. Just because I had sabotaged any chance I had of working there didn't mean that I wouldn't have liked to have continued to do the work. Complicated and conflicted seemed to be the buzzwords for everything I experienced at S4. As I neared our neighborhood, I remembered something else that Dennis had said. Maybe I could reapply in six to nine months. I don't know if he was simply throwing me crumbs or a lifeline. At the time, I envisioned that in the weeks and months to come, I might have to rely on either of those two to help sustain me and keep me moving forward. I came home from the visit with Dennis to an empty house, and in a way, that was fine with me. After everything else that had gone on, I didn't know if I had the energy to confront Tracy immediately with what I'd learned. I knew that I wanted to be on my game, so to speak, but this was anything but a game. I sat in an easy chair in the living room with a drink I'd made, hoping I could be distracted by something mindless on the television. When that didn't work, I prowled around in my home lab. I'd recently bought some electronics equipment I'd had my eye on for a while, and I distractedly read through the manuals while sipping a second drink. Though alcohol should have numbed some of the pain I was feeling, it didn't. It eased my nerves a bit, and after a while what was going on with Dennis receded, but the Tracy betrayal came rushing in. Simply put, I was pissed off. We'd met a lot to each other, and she'd been there for me during one of the darkest moments in my life. I didn't deserve this. Nothing I'd ever done or said could justify the pain she was inflicting on me. 
I would never do anything like that to her. If I thought that things weren't right between us, I would have said something, tried to work it out, and if that failed, we would go our separate ways. That would hurt, but nothing compared to this. I must have drifted off. I went upstairs to bed, and Tracy was already there, sound asleep. I got out of bed first the next morning and brewed a pot of coffee. Tracy came down while I was finishing the first cup. She filled her own, and then mine. She sat down and looked at me, widened her eyes in expectation. I didn't say anything. She frowned and said sarcastically, "'Good morning.' No, it isn't, I said. Not by a long shot. What's going on? What happened? I told her what I knew and how I'd found out. She sat there looking at me, her expression stealing itself as she fiddled with a spoon. I don't know what to say, she said after I'd concluded. She shifted in her chair and brought one leg up underneath, turning away from me slightly. How about, I'm sorry? I'm treating you like shit, and I'm sorry? I'm not treating you like shit. Things happen. I wasn't trying to... I immediately cut her off. Don't even... What? Say that you weren't trying to hurt me. How did you expect me to feel? I've been doing nothing but trying to do the best for you, busting my ass to make a life for us, make things as easy as possible for you. Running around at all hours of the night, leaving me here all the time? What did you expect? That really got to me. What did I expect? I was nearly shouting at this point. I expected you to understand that I was working on a highly sensitive project. I expected you to understand that the hours were strange. I didn't expect you to start fucking your flight instructor as thanks for me taking on a second job and trying to better things for us. It isn't just the sex. I don't want to hear that. I needed you, especially with everything else going on. Well, if you would have listened to me then, maybe all this Dennis shit wouldn't be hitting the fan. I told you that you were playing with fire, but you love that. You love taking risks and flying in the face of authority. I pounded my hand on the table. The utensil jumped and a tiny pool of cream shuddered. Don't turn this around on me. I'm not the one who did anything wrong. I'm not turning this around. I'm saying that things are really complicated right now. I heard what you told me about Dennis hauling your ass in. I knew this was going to turn out bad. I knew it. Now's not the time. The hell it isn't. Yeah, we have to talk about marriage. We'll do that. But for now, don't you think we've got a few more pressing items on our agenda to deal with? The phone rang. I locked eyes with Tracy and laughed ruefully. This is how fucked up things are. I'm wondering about the lesser of two evils. Is that your boyfriend calling and wondering where you are... Or it's that Dennis luring me out somewhere so he can finish this whole thing off. Tracy and I went around and around for a while, until neither of us was sure who was the monkey and who was the weasel and who was chasing whom. We at last agreed to table for the rest of the day any discussions about next steps, her calling it off, us calling it quits. Let things settle down. Let me focus on what I needed to do. After the reminder she made that I'd put us in jeopardy, that I'd, as she put it, potentially screwed the pooch professionally at the very least, I seethed. Two wrongs don't make a right. In my mind, they raise the number of wrongs to another power. Keep raising the number of sins of omission and commission until you can't see the forest for the trees, or the clichés. A few days passed without incident. I got back into the regular routine of picking up rolls of film, processing them, and delivering the finished pictures. Wayne and his wife were still not certain if the business was right for them. That was fine with me. Now that it looked as if the S-4 work was truly over, 
I needed some income. Having the familiar rhythms of work also soothed my admittedly raw nerves. The work also gave me an excuse to get out of the house, both to be away from Tracy and to allow me to meet face to face with Jean, John, and Jason, each separately. I told them about the meeting I'd had with Dennis. Our conversations were brief. We commiserated for a while. I told them that I had things under control. It was worrisome, of course, but I thought that having gone out there with each of them had provided me with a kind of insurance policy. Gratefully, they were each okay with that, and didn't feel I'd betrayed them or put them in jeopardy. John's opinion held a little more weight with me because of the kind of work he sometimes did for the government and the people he knew in the CIA. He suggested that I get the hell out of there right away. He'd asked if the surveillance teams were back, and I told him that they were. You can hunker down here in the bunker if you need to. In fact, you should. He unlocked one of the gun cabinets in his study to show me a part of his collection. Unnecessary, since I already knew about them. They'd be fools to try to come storming in here. A. It would be really hard for them to get in here. And B. It would be too high profile of a scene. That's not how they like to operate. I thanked him and told him I'd consider it and in fact I did stay there for a few nights over the next couple of weeks. With me barely noticing it, we turned the page on April and moved into May. I still had in mind the fact that Dennis was going to call me, and he'd instructed me to be around for that. At that stage, I didn't want to piss him off any more than I already had. By the start of the second week of May, nearly a month after the meeting with Dennis, I was driving back from a photo drop-off at Jean's office. I was on the east side of Las Vegas on Eastern Avenue, heading for home via Charleston Boulevard and then the freeway. A half mile or so from the on-ramp, I noticed a car coming up from behind, closing somewhat quickly. I was driving the sports car that I'd taken out to Indian Springs, the 280Z. Maybe it was a remnant of my jet car days and being around people at drag strips, but my first assumption, confirmed when the car didn't overtake me but pulled alongside, was that this was someone looking for a race or otherwise messing around. Instinct took over, and I accelerated, thinking I'd beat them to the on-ramp. I cut in front of them, and they pulled alongside again. A quick sidelong glance allowed me to see two head shapes, nothing more distinct than that, in the car's front seat. We did this catch-up, speed-up thing one more time before we got to the on-ramp. I had to slow at that point in order to make the turn. I was ahead of them and figured that was that. It wasn't. The on-ramp was a single lane, and the other car drove with two wheels on the shoulder and two in the dirt and grass alongside it. Adrenaline shot through me, as much because I wondered if I was going to witness a crash and also from fear of who these guys were and what they might try to do to me. A shot rang out, and I felt the rear of my car slewing sideways. Instinctively, I turned the wheel hard left to correct, and that took me off the ramp and into the grass. I came to a stop. I was paralyzed with fear at that moment. I sat with my arms, elbows locked, head pointed straight ahead, just waiting certain that someone was going to come up to the window and fire another shot at me. I don't know how long I sat in that position, but by the time I looked around, all the dust had settled, the other car was nowhere in sight. I eased the driver's side door open and got out. Traffic thumped by on the boulevard, and I could hear the faint whish and whoosh of interstate traffic in the distance. Keeping time with thumps was my thudding heart. I walked around the back of the car and saw that my passenger side rear tire was flat and that a round hole was visible in the sidewall. I probed the opening with my finger, felt the strands of rubber, and above that, nearer the tread, the steel belts. I determined that the tire still had enough structural integrity to support the car. I was no more than five miles or so from home. All I wanted to do was get out of there and get to a safe place. By this time, the sun had gone down completely, and it was full-on dark, 
so I put on my emergency flashers. I made it onto the expressway, and doing no more than twenty to thirty miles an hour in the right lane, made for home. I was grateful that a utility company truck pulled in behind me. The driver must have noticed the tire and my distress. He put on the flashing lights on the roof of his vehicle, as well as his hazard lights. All of that flashing drew a lot of attention, and reminded me a bit of the scene in the desert, but I was glad for the escort to my exit. As I drove along, the reality of what had happened started to set in. I'd fired weapons often enough to know that it's hard to hit a target from a standstill. To be able to fire from a moving car or into another moving car and hit a tire was either a stroke of luck, good luck for me that they hadn't hit the gas tank or me, and bad luck for them if either of those two options had been their intent, and bad luck for me if these guys had been aiming for that target and had succeeded in hitting it. Those guys would have had to be pros. Maybe all they wanted to do was warn me. If so, the message was received. I got another bit of fright when I pulled off the expressway. The utility truck followed me off the ramp and all the way home. I briefly considered not going home and trying to lose them. I told myself to just calm down and proceed to James Lovell. When I signaled to enter my driveway, the truck flashed its bright lights in recognition and went on its way. I breathed another sigh of relief and gratitude. I slumped at the wheel for a few seconds, my forehead resting on it. When I looked up, I noticed that there was another car, one unfamiliar to me, parked alongside me. Startled, I wondered if it was best to just remain inside or try to run for it. A few seconds later, a woman in a dark suit tight-walked over to me, waving an envelope in her hand. What was this? A processes server notifying me that I was being sued for divorce? A female assassin? Publisher's clearinghouse coming to inform me that I was a lucky winner? It turned out to be none of those. As she got closer, I recognized her as Joyce, another real estate appraiser. I was supposed to have stopped by her office after Jean's. In all the commotion, I'd completely forgotten. I got out of the car and stepped into a cloud of perfume. Bob, I hope you don't mind. I live nearby, and I was on my way to dinner. A date, actually. Nice place off the strip. First time going there. So excited. It's okay, Joyce. I owe you an apology. It's fine, Bob. Just fine. Just that I'll need these tomorrow. You know how it is, Bob. I'd begun to wonder if she was going to bob me to death. Sure, I do. I went to lean against the car, casually, but feeling a bit light-headed after the rush. I staggered a little, given the car's leaning lopsidedness. She looked at me, then down at her feet, and then at me again, appraising. Bob, your car looks a little funny. More, is your driveway sagging? I'd get that taken care of. Professional opinion, of course, Bob. No, driveway's fine. Just that someone shot my tire out a little earlier. Oh, well, only in Vegas. She handed the envelope with the film roll in it. I really, really need these first thing in the morning, Bob. I nodded. Enjoy your evening, Joyce, I said, realizing that I was seriously outgunned in the name game. As she drove away, I marveled at how she had acted, as if someone getting the tire of a car shot out while driving was just a normal part of the daily commute. But it wasn't. I was completely unnerved. After the brief mini-absurdity with Joyce, I returned to the other absurdity in my life. Despite Joyce's assessment that these kinds of things happen in Vegas, they didn't. I could have encountered some random act of violence but in my gut I sensed something more sinister lurking beneath the surface of a coincidence gone bad. Dennis had said they would be in touch. Was this the form that re-establishing of communication was going to take? Given the circumstances, I abandoned my no-phone-calls rule. I immediately got in touch with Jean and John. John was emphatic. I had to get over to his place immediately. 
it was the safest location for me, and thought that together we could formulate a plan of action. I decided it was best to do as John instructed. Jean had been in favor all along of me getting away from the house and potentially out of Las Vegas. In the weeks since I'd met with Dennis, the observers had been a constant presence, though they had stopped tailing me. By the time I'd arrived, it seemed as if John had already formulated the start of a plan. You protected yourself by telling us about what you were doing, right? Yes. And that worked, didn't it? Well, John, I don't know about worked. You're still above ground, aren't you? Still breathing. That's true. So what I think is, stick with the formula. Except you tweak it a little bit. Go wider with the information. How do I do that? Stand on a street corner like some loon with a days until doomsday sign? That would work. But your sign-painting skills probably aren't up to snuff. I've seen your handwriting. I think you're right about going wider. I was thinking of that myself. Mind if I call George Knapp? Get him over here? I trust him. Fine. George Knapp was a reporter for the local ABC affiliate in Las Vegas. He covered the usual stuff, but also did some investigative journalism into political corruption and the like. He was also one of the first journalists in the city to really poke around and into Area 51. He'd interviewed John before, and if John liked him and trusted him, even considering John's lack of a filter, that was good enough for me. John got me a drink and escorted me into his office. I was joined later by George and his boss, the station's manager, Bob Stovall. It seemed a bit strange to be face to face with a man who was in my living room a lot of nights. George had a straightforward demeanor and a candor that put me at ease. John, on the other hand, didn't. He was looking out for my best interests, but he immediately took the lead in speaking with the two TV guys. He was acting as if he was my attorney not as if he was asking for a favor, essentially. He started out by making demands, telling them I'd go on camera, wouldn't reveal my name, and I would only answer yes or no questions. That last bit got to me. It's not like I'm on trial, John. You don't have to worry about me saying too much and possibly incriminating myself. I can't believe now how naive I was to believe that I wasn't going to be put on trial not in the legal sense, but in the court of public opinion. I shared more of my story with George and Bob, and eventually we came to an agreement. We'd do a piece that they would broadcast the following day. I wouldn't use my own name, they would only show me in silhouette to protect my identity, and I would give them responses that went beyond simple yes or no replies. I was concerned about the guys watching my house, so they left it up to me to give them the location, and they would send a truck over. I'd think about it overnight and see who would be willing to have this all go on. We chatted for a while longer, then shook hands. John and I sat up long into the night, speculating about how my coming forward on television would be received by Dennis and the powers that be. We knew I would be stirring up a shitstorm in the desert, but kicking the sand up in someone's face was better than having my tires shot out from underneath me. Maybe it was the product of such a long day, but it took me a while to realize that a shitstorm and a sandstorm weren't quite the same thing. But John must have understood, except for one thing. He dozed off. I made my way to the guest bedroom and figured that a shower would help ease some of the tension from my body. I stood under the spray with my eyes shut the sound of the water on my skull a soothing and sibilant tone. I wondered if I was doing the right thing, half marveled and half bemoaned the fact that it had all come down to this. I wasn't prone to the if-onlys, but as the room filled with steam and I could finally feel some weariness overtaking me, I wondered what it would have been like if I had been content to remain Bob the Photo Guy. And later... As I drifted off to sleep, I wondered after tomorrow who I would be known as. One thing was for certain, I wasn't going to be Bob the blank. Chapter 9
There are times when you just have to trust your gut instinct. There are times when you have to trust other people. When the two of those are working in concert, then there's a pretty good chance that you're heading in the right direction. Though I didn't know George Knapp at all before I met him, I trusted that he believed in my story, and he believed that it needed to be made available for wider consumption. I'd gone back and forth on the issue of the public's right to know about the presence of these craft and our government and military's involvement with them. I wasn't, strictly speaking, anti-authoritarian. I didn't rebel against people in positions of power just because they were in power. What generally got me a bit riled up was when authorities injudiciously wielded power or didn't account for the fact that not everyone was incapable of behaving rationally. Again, that's going back to the idea of a widespread panic or serious social disruption resulting from revelations that there were other life forms in the universe and we'd had contact with them. I'm not sure I bought into that idea completely. I also understood that whoever was able to decrypt how this astounding technology worked needed, as the phrase goes, to use their powers for good and not evil. And if no one but a select few knew we had that power, then they would have greater reign to do with it what they wanted and without impunity. That was not good. But as I woke up in John's house and thought more and more about what I'd committed to, the on-camera interview, my decision was based more on self-preservation than altruism. The blend wasn't so highly concentrated with self-interest than it had been, but it was still predominant. I wasn't trying to be a hero. I was simply trying to still be, to continue to exist. In the passage of time, I can recount these events in a much more reasonable, much more logical fashion. At the time, I was in a state of panic wondering if my decision to go wide was going to fan the smoldering embers into a fire, or throw enough water on them to douse them completely. I knew that I had the full support of George, Jean, and John. That was helpful, but in the end, only one person should be responsible for decisions like these, the one whose life is most immediately going to be affected. To say that I discussed my decision with Tracy would be a gross overstatement. I informed her of what I was going to do, but I didn't ask for permission, nor did I consult with her about how I should conduct myself. To her credit, she and her sister both decided to accompany me on the set of the interview. I realize that using the word set, as in a movie set, implies some kind of fictional aspect of what was going on, but we did stage the interview at my request. I mention this only because of how the day proceeded. I had agreed to appear in silhouette, and so the camera operator who accompanied George, the sound guy, and George himself all had to figure out how to achieve the visual effects they wanted to make it look interesting and to abide by my request that my identity be protected. Because, as Jean kept reminding me, John Lear's house was a kind of secure compound, we chose to do the interview at his place. I don't care who you are, or where you live, or what kind of relationship you have with your neighbors, if you drive along in a remote coverage TV news van, with its call letters and insignia emblazoned all over it into someone's driveway, you're going to draw a crowd of onlookers, even if the van disappears from view. Most of the time when I'd gone to visit John, I'd parked in his driveway. It wasn't possible to be seen from the street, so it was unlikely that anyone would be able to identify me when I came out of the house and got positioned to speak with George. For that reason, on May 14, 1989, my supporters and I stood around waiting while the technicians did their thing. George had briefed me very generally about the kinds of questions he was going to ask and I had to appear on camera for a couple of test shoots to make sure that I was framed properly and the lighting worked out. I couldn't resist one more poke at those in charge of the program, and I instructed George to refer to me by my chosen pseudonym, Dennis. I'm not sure if that qualifies as gallows humor, but I did have a small sense of what it might be like to be facing a moment so heavily freighted with consequences. 
I chose to look at the interview as an example of one of the most widely known principles of physics, Newton's first and second laws of motion. I could still act on what I'd set into motion, and even up until the last moment, when I was standing on my mark and George stood off camera and signaled to me that it was a go, I still wasn't certain if I'd let any words come out of my mouth. I did, and I found that the release of one was easily followed by another, and then more and more. We talked for perhaps five minutes. I gave George the basics. The interview was more about the existence of the craft, my role at S-4 generally, and involved no critique of the program, no mention of why it was or how it was that I had become embroiled in a dispute with my now former employees. When it was aired, we all gathered to watch it at John's house. The interview was pared down to just a couple of minutes at most. It hit all the high points, and I got a big kick out of seeing the name Dennis appear on screen beneath my shadowy image. I was glad that George had kept in the part about me stating that I believed the technology needed to be kept classified. The fact that we obtained the technology from an extraterrestrial civilization should be public knowledge. I'd finally settle on that as my stance, believed it at that moment, and continued to believe it ever since. I had no idea how the piece was going to be received. I felt some relief that, again to revert to the Newtonian metaphor, I'd set an object in motion. That would at least govern to some degree what they did next and what I did next. Like I said, I've always been a lover of big reactions and explosions and that sort of thing. Being inert and observing things that are inert is, for the most part, tedious. I wanted to see how all of this was going to be resolved, and I hoped that it would be so sooner rather than later. Either let me go back to my old life, or at least let me deal with the new one. After the broadcast was over, I returned to my home on James Lovell. I didn't feel like I was in exile from my shattered marriage or my possibly ruined career as a scientist. As I saw it, I'd done nothing wrong and shouldn't walk around feeling like a leper or a pariah. That feeling didn't last very long. The phone rang, and I picked up. Bob, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? No. It was Dennis. He didn't say anything else, and in a second or two, the connection terminated. So much for any kind of certainty. So much for the laws of physics somehow applying here. So much for feeling safe and secure in my home. Without a word to Tracy, I slipped out the door and returned to John's house where I spent the night. I lay in the dark and thought about all the ways that this should matter, but concluded as the first gray light of morning came through the windows that living or dying was seldom a question of choice. It was often governed by forces inside and outside of ourselves, but I was too tired and too distraught by all that had gone on to really care which outcome was produced. As before, I also gave some thought to fleeing, but knowing who I was dealing with and powers they likely possessed, running away seemed fruitless. They'd be able to track me down if they wanted to. At least in Las Vegas, I had my core group of friends who had my best interest at heart. Though I woke up the next morning and initially felt like I wanted to just sleep the rest of the day and many others away, duty called. Despite being freaked out the previous night by Dennis's call, I had remembered to grab a packet of photos that Jean needed. I set out early for his office. I stopped at a cafe for a quick bite to eat and sat there nervously looking around the room for any signs of suspicious activity. I stopped doing that pretty quickly when I realized that I didn't have a firm grasp of what might constitute suspicious activity. I finished up and left, scanning the newspapers in the box outside the cafe. Nothing on the front page indicated that my story had been important enough to be above the fold, and maybe not even anywhere in the paper. I chided myself for thinking I was such a big deal, and headed over to Jean's office. I walked in 
and another man was with him. Bob, Gene said, this is Gene. How you doing? the man said. I'm an appraiser too. Weird, isn't it? Gene, Gene, like you stepped into another universe. In fact, the man looked nothing at all like Gene. His olive complexion and thinning black hair splayed across his pate in dark isosceles clumps. I know. How about this? Gene, Gene, the dancing machine. Remember that show with Chuck Barris, the gong show? The man said. Sorry, I don't. Gene number two narrowed his gaze and cocked his head. Hey, this guy, he said, directing his remarks to Gene. Sounds like the guy I saw on the news last night. Nah, I don't know. I saw it, but I don't hear the similarity. He's just the photo guy. I shrugged and said, Just the photo guy. When we were alone, I said to Gene, That's a bit scary. I thought about them using a voice disguiser, but didn't think it was necessary. Now this? Gene tried to reassure me that it was a fluke and he was eventually proved right. Over the course of the next few days and into June, no one else claimed that I sounded like the alien guy on TV. In the years to come, I'd learned that the brief bit of footage that aired that night eventually made its way to various locations around the globe. I thought I had some sense of the power of the media and mass communications back then, but didn't realize what a greater force it would become and how it would directly impact my life. My friends took on a more low-tech campaign on my behalf. Gene and a few others, suspecting that his phone line was now being tapped as well, started to talk more openly over the phone about what I'd been doing. He called friends and family, enlarging the circle of those in the know. The idea was simple. If Dennis and others decided that I was such a security risk that I needed to be killed, and more people knew what it was that I was doing, having those individuals with that knowledge could either act as a deterrent or increase the number of people who would know the truth of why I had been killed. The fact that I was eliminated, we believed, would confirm the truth of what I had revealed. In their conversations with others, my inner circle also stated that they had written letters to members of various agencies with the government, etc., these communications, the letters, would be far more difficult to track and interfere with. We felt that simply giving the appearance of having communicated more widely was enough to keep those who might want to do me harm at bay. We were going to keep them guessing as to who knew what and created our own kind of disinformation campaign. I was still being followed and monitored, and Gene reported to me that he believed he had been tailed as well. I can't confirm this, and neither could Jean, but it certainly was within the realm of possibility. The kinds of gamesmanship that was going on was never fun or thrilling. It was always frightening and aggravating. I don't know if Dennis felt the same way, but eventually, on the third Saturday in June, the 17th, after having been contacted by Dennis that a personal-level meeting was needed, we set a time and place for a face-to-face -face meeting. At my suggestion, we were to meet at eight in the evening at the Union Plaza Casino in downtown Las Vegas. The more public the location, the better, and a Las Vegas casino on a Saturday night was sure to be crowded. As it happened, a friend and former colleague from Los Alamos, Joe Vaninetti, was in town. He knew what was going on generally with me. Gene and I brought him up to speed on the most recent events, and Joe helped us with our planning for the meeting with Dennis. I wasn't about to go there alone. I also wasn't about to expose my friends to any more jeopardy than necessary. I didn't think that Dennis or whoever might have been with him, or at whose urging the meeting was set up, intended to do me harm at the casino. But as a scientist, you know that you should never jump to any conclusions. We devised a plan so that Joe and Jean could keep me in sight at all times, or at least be able to track my location. The day of the meeting I spent quietly at home, reading. I had resumed my activities at the library. Prior to going to work out at S4, and for most of my adult life, 
I hadn't earned enough money to afford subscriptions to all the scientific journals and periodicals that I wanted to read in order to keep current on latest advances. As I recall, even back then, the wonderful, though not highly technical magazine Nature cost nearly twenty dollars an issue. Some of the less popular ones, like the Journal of Technical Physics, were somewhat obscure, but its peer-reviewed articles were fascinating to me. I struggled with my focus that day, but being in a library had a calming effect on me. But you know you've got a lot on your mind when an article on microsecond plasma pulses in M.W. range can't hold your attention. I sat there watching the odd assortment of characters who frequent the library. I suppose that people who don't live in Las Vegas and only visit the Strip don't really think about the daily lives of its residents, let alone libraries. In the days before the Internet exploded with information that we could access so easily, libraries were still an interesting gathering place for those who pursued esoteric as well as commonplace knowledge. I thought a bit about the site of our meeting. The Union Plaza Hotel sat on the site of the former Union Pacific Railroad Station. The hotel still had a train station as part of its structure. I sought out photos of the older version, built in 1940, and admired its Art Moderne, or Streamline Moderne, façade, a later variation of the Art Deco movement. In the photographs I saw, the station's single-story front that faced Main Street looked like the diner that Edward Hopper depicted in his great painting, Nighthawks. Something always captivated me about that painting. The couple sitting at the counter, the lone man with his back to the viewer, the counterman going about his business. It sometimes struck me as desperately lonely, and at other times, hopeful. Those people had some place that they could go, even if they didn't speak, some place where they could find some fellowship. We don't build great cathedrals much any more, and our artists don't tend to depict them in their works the way painters centuries ago once did. I was in a reflective mood, obviously, while also trying to make sense of my present. I can't say that I ever uttered the words, Why me, when it came to my dealings with naval intelligence, E.G. and G., and Dennis, as the representative of some larger body of people. I simply accepted what had happened. And in those moments, as I flipped through that book depicting some early scenes of Las Vegas and its development, I allowed myself to feel some sense of loss at what had transpired. I'd been privileged to work at S-4, and had seen a technological marvel that defied my complete understanding. In a way, I was like some pilgrim who traveled to Chartres in France in the thirteenth century and had seen the marvels of the flying buttress and wondered how it was done, and maybe worried that it might all come crashing down on my head, but believed that, no, God in His goodness was holding that high ceiling aloft. Or maybe I was like someone who lived long enough to come to Las Vegas and arrive at the Union Pacific Railroad Station aboard a locomotive, powered by a means that was a marvel of its time, internal combustion and electromechanical. The streamliners of that era were capable of an astounding one hundred miles an hour. We'd made progress, to be sure, and who was to say what a race from a distant galaxy might have been able to accomplish if they'd been around longer or hadn't been around as long, but possessed an intellect superior to our own. As much as I said that I wanted all of this to be over, and wondered how my meeting with Dennis might lead me toward or away from that goal, I was saddened by the end of the opportunity I'd been given. I was sad about the end of my marriage. I don't know if I had any real innocence left to be able to lose it, but I wished that in all that had gone on, there was more time to just simply marvel at it all, to take in the beauty and elegant simplicity of the propulsion system, to appreciate it for what it was, and not think of it so much as a problem to be solved, but a gift that I could take pleasure in. I knew that the time for my appointment with Dennis was nearing. The library emitted a signal it was last call. I slid the periodicals back on their shelves, in defiance of the request to return them to the front desk. I went home and walked through each of the rooms. 
thinking a bit about Tracy and our time there together. Sometimes things change, but they aren't always a sign of progress. Before I knew it, it was time to leave. Joe, Jean, and I all climbed into Joe's vehicle and headed into downtown Vegas. By the time the glittering lights of the hotel were visible, my stomach was in knots. As much as I was concerned for the personal safety of us all, I knew that there were a lot of forms that the do-you-know-what-we-can-do-to-you question could take. I could easily imagine having all my financial records messed with, my education and employment history disappearing, all of which wouldn't be mere inconveniences, but could really damage me and ruin my life. I felt like I'd already lost so much and was going to have to start over in so many ways that it felt overwhelming. Stepping into the noisy cacophony of a Vegas casino was a bit of sensory overload, given my exile at John's house and my time at the library. I truly did feel like I was under assault, that the loud noises, the flashing lights, the loud thrum of conversations pierced by sharp laughter produced a physical pain in my head and throughout my body that had me gritting my teeth. As per our plan, I'd entered alone and began to scout for Dennis. At three-minute intervals, Jean and then Joe would enter the casino, chose strategically advantageous seats at the slot machines, and keep an eye on me. I'd described Dennis to them both, but I didn't want them approaching him. I kept up my reconnoitering the slot room and other parts of the casino, dodging waitresses and patrons in the narrow openings between the games and tables. After waiting fifteen minutes, and wondering if the rules applied about a professor being late to a class, I found a staff member to assist me with a request. I asked that someone page Dennis Mariana and ask him to meet his party at the entrance to the blackjack room. Several minutes later, I saw Dennis working his way from the entrance toward where I'd been standing along a sidewall. He was part of a large clump of people trying to make their way deeper into the casino. He looked exactly as he always did, unsmiling, eyes focused straight ahead, his neat mustache, hair, and erect posture hardly allowing him to blend in with the more casual and relaxed patrons. I walked toward him, making myself very clearly present in front of him, my heart rate climbing and my throat tightening. Dennis walked right past me, not acknowledging me in the slightest. My eyes darted from side to side, and I noticed another man, his presence very much like Dennis's as he stood stiffly along the wall not far from where I'd previously been standing. I looked at him again, stared at him, and realized that he was one of the security people I'd seen while at S-4. It made sense to me that Dennis wasn't going to be alone. I saw that Joe and Jean were both looking in my direction. I tried to point out Dennis to them both, but knew that given the cluster of people moving through the area, it was going to be hard for them to positively identify which man he was. I walked over to Joe and then to Jean, letting them know what I wanted to do next. Jean, I'm going to go in there, into the blackjack room, and I want you to follow me. Stay out of sight, but keep an eye on Dennis. I saw him, Bob. I spotted a guy who I think matched the description. Good but I want you to be more positive, undeniably positive about the identification. I'm going to speak with him, and I need you to witness that, to have zero doubt in your mind that the man I was talking to was Dennis. Got it. Jean trailed behind me. To my right, I saw Dennis sitting at a table. I inclined my head toward him to let Jean know I'd spotted the guy. I also held up my hand briefly to remind Jean that I didn't want him to approach Dennis at all. It was nearly comical to see Dennis in that environment. He was sandwiched between two curvaceous women who were both enjoying their drinks and the festive atmosphere. I watched Dennis for a minute or so, and he never took his eyes off his cards, a remarkable feat of self-restraint. I circled the blackjack pit and came up behind Dennis. For some reason... By this time, whatever anxiety I was feeling seemed to disappear. The dealer eyed me suspiciously. He'd seen me circling and looking at the table. 
I could have easily been eyeing everyone's cards. A stupid and blatantly obvious cheat, but not one I was working. Well, Dennis, you said you wanted to meet, and here I am. What's the deal? I spoke loud enough to ensure that the dealer heard me. He was some six to eight feet away. I saw his expression soften at my words. Dennis didn't react at all. I waited a minute before I said to Dennis, Dennis, what the hell is going on? What is this shit? I stared at the back of Dennis's head, noticed an ingrown hair that had begun to boil the skin in a small but angry red welt. Aware that creating some kind of scene was not wise, I walked away. Jean joined me on the edge of the pit, edging out from behind a slot machine. Dennis remained in our sight line. What the hell was that? Jean asked. I don't know. More bullshit from them. From him. What do you want to do? Jean asked. I don't know what we can do. He doesn't want to talk. He hasn't told me where we could meet. Nothing. Do you want to tail him? Follow him to his car? At least get his license number? I was so frustrated and let down at that point, so sick of Dennis's arrogance, that I agreed to that plan, knowing it really wouldn't do us one bit of good. But at least it was something. Dennis stood up from the table and merged into the crowd. We all moved to follow him, but in just a few seconds the crowd swallowed him up. Jean and I made our way toward the front entrance, near Joe's position. Did you see anybody who looked like Dennis leaving? Joe shook his head and shrugged. Not really. Not really or no? I sounded more agitated than I really was. Sorry, Bob. Nobody that looked like your guy came past. Split up and find them? Jean asked. Why not? I said. We each took off in solo pursuit. I checked all the tables, the bathrooms, even stuck my head inside a bar and a restaurant nearby. Not a single sign of him. After twenty to thirty minutes, I wandered back to the entrance. Jean and Joe eventually showed up. I could use a drink, Jean said. Not here, I told him. We drove to a small tavern nearer my house than the joints along the strip or downtown. Why would he do that? Jean asked. He asked for the meeting. He had backup with the other guy. I guess we shouldn't assume that the other security guy was with Dennis. Easy enough to think he was, but not necessarily true. Joe's face lit up in recognition of what I was suggesting. So... Dennis says he wants to talk to you personally. He shows up, sees the same guy you do. Now he's thinking that he's being watched. He talks to you, he's in the shit with somebody else above him. Could be, I said. I swirled the ice in my glass and held it up to the light. Things are about as opaque as this. I'm not a gambling man when it comes to people's actions, but I'm pretty sure that Dennis will be back in touch, Jean said. I wonder if he's as confused by all of this as you are, Bob, Joe added. That may be. I've got no evidence to say one way or the other. Until he tells me it's so, it's all conjecture. I was definitely disappointed at how the evening turned out. I knew that there were a lot more unpleasant alternative endings to it, but as with so much of what had gone on, this felt far too incomplete far too fragmented to really feel satisfying, far too much like how life generally makes us all feel. Chapter 10 If I was hoping for closure on the experiences I had with the people who hired me to reverse-engineer that propulsion system, including Dennis, I wasn't going to get it. Not then, not ever. Unfortunately for me, E.G. and G., S-4, and all the rest of that drama, was just one part of the ongoing unraveling of my life. Even though the failed meeting with Dennis resulted in the end of the surveillance teams watching me and my house, I still took some precautions in the weeks and months to come. Among those was taking different routes when I went to the gym, went to Jean's office, 
or just continued to do my job processing film and the pickups and drop-offs that entailed. Even though there were no more incidents of my car being broken into or someone running me off the road and firing shots at my tires, those incidents had already exacted a toll. I felt like I constantly had to have my head on a swivel, and the paranoia those experiences induced contributed to my stress. In the aftermath of that first broadcast, Tracy moved out of the house. That made me terribly sad, but I wasn't going to stop her. She'd betrayed me by having an affair, but that didn't mean that I couldn't work toward forgiving her and ultimately get there. Though she moved out, we continued to talk. We decided that we should speak with a counselor and made arrangements to do that. We sat down in his office, and he asked us to describe what had been going on and how it was that we ended up in his office. All went well for a while, but I could see a cloud of disapproval or disbelief move across his face when Tracy talked about her affair and how my working with alien spacecraft and having government agents watching us all the time contributed to her infidelity. We each got a chance to talk about what we hoped to accomplish and what we'd been through. At the end of the session, the therapist sat for a few seconds. He bridged his hands in front of himself and leaned back in his chair. Then he turned away for a moment to make a few more notes. The only sound in the room was the scratching of his pen across the page. The light through the window cast a saucer-shaped shadow on the carpet. He looked back at the two of us after that and said, "'There's nothing I can do for the two of you. I don't want to see you again.' Tracy and I looked at one another completely stunned. We got up and slinked out of the room. Once we got inside the car, we sat there for a second before we both burst out laughing. "'We got fired,' Tracy said. "'That's not good when your therapist fires you.' We didn't try to find another counselor, but it eventually became clear that as I got involved in doing more interviews that whatever damage I'd done to the relationship and what she'd done wasn't something we both were truly invested in fixing. We decided it was best to just go our own ways and not make anything more difficult for the other person. I'd lost one wife to disease and now a second one to work and infidelity no matter how strong you think you are mentally, or how amicable the parting, a divorce preys on your sense of self and self-worth. A few of the why-me moments, why did I have to accept that job, why did she have to have an affair and mess up my chances, and a host of others, brought me pretty low. I understood why some people chose to end their lives. I didn't feel any of the suicidal impulses, but on an intellectual level, I could understand the desire and the despair that might lead to it. As much as was possible, I tried to resume my normal activities as soon as I could after the initial broadcast George had done. I knew immediately, even in those pre-internet days, the power of the media. Two days after that first interview aired, George was on the phone with me. Listen, this story is getting picked up around the world. A Japanese station called me. They want to fly you over there and conduct their own interviews with you. Japan, I said dully. For an instant, the thought appealed to me. I could get away from here and escape everything. Yeah, pretty amazing. What do you think? George asked, his voice twinged with a mixture of curiosity and trepidation. No, not interested. Mind if I ask why? You're the investigative journalist. You figure it out. George laughed. That's good. That's funny. At the time, I wouldn't have been able to tell you if I was joking or not. I was feeling deadened. It was like I was an unplugged electric guitar. Someone could pluck at a string, but it produced a pale imitation of the sounds it was capable of producing. Well, Bob... I'm kind of glad to hear that. I mean, the exposure is great. That's one of the reasons why I called. I knew he expected me to respond to that some way, ask what he wanted or something to that effect. 
I just let the silence linger. So the response here has been great. We'd like to do more interviews with you. Again, I didn't respond. At least, not directly. I've thought about the Japan trip. I think I'd like to do it. Maybe it would be good to get away. That's great. I'll see about the arrangements. What about my offer? More interviews. George waited and then filled in the gaps. To his credit, he didn't sound exasperated or panicked. As you can imagine, some people are a little skeptical. Anyone could have made up what you said. We didn't get into much detail. To be honest, I need to be convinced. I need better evidence. I need to verify some things. Yeah. As I'm sure you know, this story has implications beyond you, beyond me for that matter. This is big stuff. Government cover-ups. This is the kind of thing I do. If you're going to trust anyone about this, I'm your guy. We both let the pause go on. I understood what he was saying. At first, coming forward was an act of self-preservation. I had only briefly considered what all this meant beyond me being able to get back to my life. I did understand that some people believed in a greater degree of transparency within the government than I did. I had a long history of working with and inside government agencies. I was comfortable with the need-to-know mentality that drove much of the control of information. I'd seen that in action in the private sector as well. But with this, I was leaning in a slightly different direction. I didn't really see the harm that would come from revealing this information. It sounded to me as if the Russians were already in the know. I thought that people would be receptive to knowing about alien life and technologies. After all, we had these craft in our possession, and it was like they were shot down in some large-scale invasion. I still didn't know how we got them, and in truth, how didn't matter. We had them, so let's just move on and see how this technology could assist us. Maybe if I put a bit more pressure on the powers that be, they might be willing or might be forced to make this information more well known. I thought about Sputnik. When we learned the Russians had a space program, and then that they'd gotten a man to orbit the Earth before we did, the result proved to be a net positive, a huge net positive, down the line. Obviously this situation was different, but I thought that the principle still applied. An open exchange of information could be a good thing. I'd seen firsthand at S-4, and in other work, what happened when compartmentalization of information took precedence over other considerations. Progress slowed. I had a pretty good idea of the weapons potential of this anti-gravity system. If we had it, and others knew we had it, maybe our having such an enormous advantage would be a real game-changer. It had been ten years since the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks II Treaty had been signed. Talks to end the Cold War were ongoing. Various Soviet republics had been rising in opposition to Kremlin rule. Momentum seemed to be in our favor, but we could have had a heavy weight to tip the balance in our favor. I told George that I would think about it and get back to him. Don't think about it too long. I'd rather do this with your cooperation. News business is tricky. People forget. I didn't tell him that people forget but that groups and agencies like I had been dealing with most likely didn't. After George and I spoke, I called John Lear to let him know that I was going to take him up on his offer. I told him that I would meet him for dinner not later than six o'clock that evening. John understood that agreeing to dinner at six o'clock meant I would be staying at his house that night. A minor precaution against eavesdropping, but a necessary one at the time. I spoke briefly with John about George's offer to do more interviews. He thought it would be wise to do them. I consulted with a few other friends, but to be honest, by the time I did, my mind was already made up. I was going to go forward with the plan to talk about what I'd seen. I also agreed with something that George told me. For this story to have any credibility, I needed to step up and allow myself to be interviewed on camera and have my likeness and name be clearly on display. The first interview I'd been silhouetted and not identified. 
That wasn't going to pass the test this time. I told him that I would allow that. George also said that it was his professional responsibility as a journalist to do more inquiring into my past. I agreed to that. George said that he would like to travel with me to Los Alamos to meet some of the people I worked with and to see where I had worked. I agreed to that. George told me that if at any time I was uncomfortable with any of this, up to the moment it was sent out over the air, he'd agree to pull the plug on it. I heartily agreed with that. In fact, I told him that if he hadn't specified that part of the agreement, I wouldn't have agreed to any of the other stipulations. I also spoke with Gene about the Japan trip and asked him if he would like to join me. In the intervening day since the offer was first presented, I'd had second thoughts, but Gene seemed to think it was a good idea. At that point, I was easily swayed and was likely just looking for reasons from other people to do or not do many things. I got another offer that I couldn't refuse. George had contacted the people in Japan to let them know that Gene and I agreed to accept their offer. A few days later, we bought tickets. That same night, I was at home and the phone rang. I picked up and a voice I couldn't identify said, If you take this trip to Japan, you will never return. Understand? He then hung up. I didn't know if this meant I was still being followed or if my phone line was still being tapped. Not that either of the two mattered. Gene and I talked it over, and since neither of us was all that excited about going in the first place, we turned in the tickets and didn't go. The Japanese later threatened to sue for the entire cost of their TV special, which I just ignored. I never heard from anyone about it again. I guess it's a reflection of what my state of mind was at the time, that the threatening phone call unnerved me only to the point that I canceled the trip. I didn't pursue any other course of action. No going to the authorities, no going on the record about it and telling George. The reason George wanted me to accompany him to Los Alamos was to speed up the process. For him to get the clearances himself, to make all the necessary arrangements would have taken a lot of time. He wanted to strike, as the saying goes, while the iron was hot. I also met with his boss, the station manager, and both of them struck me as consummate professionals. They'd agreed to the conditions I'd mandated for the first interview, and everything had gone off as planned. As much as I was drifting at that point in my life, as much as I was feeling unmoored from the life I'd once led just a few short months before, it was great to have the two of them and my friends in my corner. No matter what happened as a result of the additional exposure, I was comfortable with accepting whatever consequences came my way. I was never going to blame anyone else for being complicit in what happened. I made my choice, and I was going to stick with it. It felt good to be able to trust someone and to trust myself. The trip to Los Alamos was relatively brief. Because I'd worked there and had contracted with them, access to the facility and to the people who could verify my presence there was a relatively easy matter. I took George around and introduced him, showed him places I'd worked and various aspects of the accelerator. George was clearly pleased to see that I hadn't fabricated a bit of my backstory. We returned to Las Vegas, and George said that he would be in touch to schedule the next taping session. We scheduled it for the last week of May, just prior to Memorial Day. We filmed in an office at the studio. I decided that since I wasn't going to have my image disguised, I should make myself as presentable as possible. I wore a gray shirt and a matching thin gray tie. I didn't want to dress too businesslike, so I wore a pair of jeans and white running shoes. Jean didn't prepare me ahead of time with a list of questions, and that was fine with me. We talked at length, but I knew that he was going to have to edit it all down to about ninety seconds for broadcast. I wasn't nervous. Blocking out the camera operator and the sound person wasn't easy. We were in a fairly tight space, but I kept reminding myself that I was having a conversation with George and no one else. He was somebody I trusted, and all I had to do was answer honestly and talk to George. I stuck around the studio while George went into another part of the facility to do his editing. I'm not sure why, but I wanted to be there in person when that evening's news, with my interview included, went out over the airwaves. 
as time went on, I thought more and more about what I was doing. I was kind of like a groom sitting in a church office while his bride and everybody else bustled about making the last preparations before a wedding. All of them were occupied with doing something, but all I could do was sit there and drink. I started off picking up a pencil and drumming it on the tabletop while considering everything I had done and what this new revelation might mean for my future. I had no idea, really, of how far-reaching the consequences might be. I didn't believe I'd be in any real physical harm. That was the initial thought I'd had in coming forward, that I should do this and protect myself. I wondered a bit about my reputation in Las Vegas and dismissed that as a concern pretty quickly. Las Vegas was a place where many people led a transient existence. They came here with some kind of dream or ideal or last resort mentality. It was kind of like the gambling that drew a lot of people to the place. You started out with high hopes, went bust, and limped home. I was concerned about making a living beyond photo processing. I'd signed up with E.G. and G., hoping to get back into the scientific community. I wasn't sure how I'd be perceived if I came forward. I damaged my chances at getting the security clearance I'd needed to work at S4. But what about at other places, like Los Alamos? What about in the private sector? That was a real unknown. That concerned me. I knew that I'd take a kind of fuck-it-all attitude in the wake of Tracy and the rest of it, but I had to be practical. I was gutted, that was for sure, but there was some instinct inside of me, some sense of survivorship that kept nagging at me. No, I wasn't going to kill myself, but was I doing something that would cripple me in a way? Was I committing some act of self-sabotage? Was I looking for an easy way out, a way to later explain whatever state of failure I'd entered into? I had been pacing for a good amount of time as I waited for the countdown to airtime. There was something inside me that hated the idea of having Dennis and the rest of them, whoever they were, win. I thought that maybe by coming forward in the manner I had, I'd done just that, beaten them. But in reality, that wasn't likely to be the case. I was pretty sure that as I sat there in that room, there was someone else out at the facility filling out the same paperwork I had, submitting to the same physical, getting introduced to Barry or some other version of Barry. The golf ball would still be hitting the ceiling and raining down bits of acoustical tile. The high-performance tests would still be going on every Wednesday night. I wouldn't be a part of any of that. What would I be a part of? I felt a gnawing in my stomach and envisioned a gaping black hole that was my future. Someone knocked at the door. We're about to go with it, someone I hadn't met before told me. If you'll follow me. We walked through the aisles of the newsroom along rows of desks and half walls. I spotted George a few yards ahead of me. He carried a large format video cassette in his hand. I took off after him. George, no, you can't, I yelled. We have to go with this, George said. His eyes darted from side to side and he'd edged around a file cabinet, and a potted plant wobbled unsteadily. "'You said up to the last second, just say the word!' George was still on the move. I accelerated and caught him around the waist and chest and tackled him. "'I'm saying the word, George! No!' We rolled around on the floor, George holding the tape just outside my grasp. I looked up and saw a few faces staring down at us though no one stepped in to intervene. "'We have a deal!' I said, sounding very much like a prepubescent boy shouting at his older brother. George scrambled to his feet. "'I'm doing the right thing, Bob. You know, cold feet is all. This is going to be okay.' With that, he went into the studio, and I sat on the floor with my head cradled in my hands and my knees drawn up wondering not for the first time or the last, what have I done? In the last twenty-seven years, I've asked myself that question many, many times. 
unlike a lot of people who've lived through a really rough period and come out on the other side who say, if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't change a thing, I would. I wouldn't have come forward. I should have probably just waited things out after learning about Tracy's affair. I would have been more patient and lived with the hope that once that matter was all settled, I could have gone to work at S4 full time. I had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to work at the forefront of science, and I pissed it away. Sure, there were the ethical implications of what was going on out there, but at heart, I'm a scientist. I seek knowledge and understanding. All that's been left in the wake of my time at S4 is other people's doubts and uncertainties about me and about the program there. As a scientist, on one level, you have to accept that there's going to be uncertainty, that your theories and findings could always eventually be proven to be less than 100% certain. Simultaneously, you also have to believe that you've cracked the code, solved the riddle, advanced human understanding. At S4, I didn't do any of that. I have to live with that regret and a bunch of others as well. This is no fairy tale. We all didn't live happily ever after. A lot of innocent people got hurt as a result of me stepping forward. People lost security clearances, jobs, possible futures because of their association with me and my revealing to them what I did. That's hard to deal with, but is in no way as hard as the consequences they had to face. Over the years, I've tried to do what I can to make amends, but words fall short and gestures fail. As for me, I picked up the pieces eventually. Over the long haul, things did get better. I've spoken a few times at conferences and done some interviews. I've had Hollywood film and TV producers contact me. In the scripts they've written, they've tried to show me as some kind of action hero, leaping onto the hoods of cars, escaping the bad guys. I'm no action hero. I wasn't then, and I'm certainly not one now. I'm no kind of hero. I've settled into a quiet life running a scientific supply company. I can't do science anymore now that my reputation has turned to crap. I've tried sending out resumes, but they produce no results not even a polite decline, just silence, the deep silence of space. I chose to come forward again and hoped to set the record straight by writing this. I didn't seek someone out. He sought me. I knew that this was going to be part of a larger overarching project, and I liked that idea. I was just one small cog in a larger machine at S4, and S4 is part of a larger story as well. I can't and won't comment on that because it is not something I witnessed or experienced myself. I'm a modest guy with modest ambitions. All I've ever done in interviews and appearances is to comment on and to relate what I know and what I did. I see no reason to change that now. I imagine that anyone caught up in events that feel larger than themselves feels the impulse to create a story that is in ways as large as the forces that are acting on them. I guess that's a part of physics. But I know that our understanding of the nature of the universe is, to put it mildly, incomplete. Maybe there's some comfort in knowing that this story is over. Maybe some will take comfort in feeling that there are some questions yet to be answered. That's life. In the end, though, I was rewarded for my patience and my perseverance. I'm married now and have a lovely wife and step-grandkids. None of them know me as the Area 51 guy, and that's just fine with me. This concludes Dreamland by Bob Lazar, narrated by Barry Abrams, copyright 2019 by Interstellar, this unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Interstellar and was produced in the year 2019 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.